Welcome back to Eurodollar University with Jeff Snyder. My name is Emil Kalinowski. Jeff Snyder is the head of global research for Alhambra Investments. Jeff, the Federal Reserve is going to be hiking interest rates, short-term interest rates, because why? Reasons. reasons. We're going to go over. <laughs> there's two big. They have some reasons, right? Two. We have talked about the market, the flattening yield curve, inver inverted euro dollar futures curve, which are market signaling, market signals, very yeah. specific market signals saying maybe you should reconsider Jay Powell. Maybe you should reconsider your votes, FOMC. But we know for a fact, as close to a fact as possible, the FOMC and Jay Powell are not going to reconsider. And there's a couple reasons why. And the reasons are, beginning with, it's not a central bank. The Federal Reserve is not a central bank. It doesn't do money. Therefore, it doesn't really pay attention to these market signals because it's not in the money business at all. It does something completely different. And because it does something completely different, the economic equation, the, their DSG models, and of course, the inflation variable, which should be money, the Fed doesn't use. They don't even know how to do it. As Milton Friedman said, inflation is always and everywhere monetary phenomenon. But if you don't do money, you're not in the money business. You're not really a central bank. You can't even use that as a way to ground and anchor your policy. You have to do these other things. So we know the Fed's going to ignore market signals. What are the justifications and rationales they're going to use to absolutely hike interest rates? For our new audience members, they must be astounded, astounded by what you just said, Jeff. It's fun because you don't stop. You just say these shocking things and just keep walking along. It's no trouble. But dear audience, what Jeff means by saying that the central bank doesn't do money, after all, they just quote unquote printed trillions of dollars. What that means is that they can't, they printed something called bank reserves, which is a kind of money, a very narrow money for a narrow set of users. It's not a real economy money. The real economy money is created by credit loans, created by commercial banks. That's where the vast majority of money comes from that runs the global economy. So I don't know when they stopped following this 50s, 60s, but they stopped being able to identify, define, measure, and map the creation of money. And since then, they've just tried to influence the people that create money through pop psychology. So that's. The Fed doesn't do money. The Fed's not a central bank. That's the bumper sticker in there. I, I hope to try to define it. But besides that enormous, enormous fly in the soup, there's also, it's like a pterodactyl's in my soup. It's not even a waiter. There's a fly in my soup. There's a pterodactyl in my soup. Okay, besides that, the two reasons they are going to raise interest rates is because employment is fantastic. There's not a lot of, shortage. There's not a lot of slack in the labor market anymore. And therefore, wages are going to take off. And somehow this is bad. And then that'll result in businesses passing right. on cons to consumers increases in goods and services because they're paying their workers more. It just all seems so backwards. But okay, Jeff. So that's one of the reasons. And we're going to pull up a graph that shows the ADP numbers and the establishment survey numbers. Jeff, help me. What are these numbers telling us? Yes, private employment. You're exactly right. We're looking at private employment because that's really a measure of the health of the private economy, which is really how the, the entire system works. And you're right. I mean, the Fed has said in no unspecific terms, no uncertain terms, hey, we're hiking rates because the unemployment rate, look at that sucker. It was 3.9%, now it's back to 4%, but that's a little statistical quirk. So 4% in unemployment rate, and we expect it to go lower and lower and lower. That's got to be inflationary, right? Because it means companies are going to have to compete for workers. And when they're competing for workers, that means wages rise. And as you just said, when wages go up, because that's the largest input cost for most businesses, they have to pass those costs on to consumers. So tight labor market, Step, 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 then you get to inflation. So the Fed is saying the Phillips curve thing, the unemployment and inflation, those two are a trade-off. And we're at that point. They believe we're at or near the point where the labor market is going to add to the inflationary pressures that uh, most people seem to associate with the CPI. I want to address two things here very quickly. First of all, the employment rate, three things. Let's do three things. The employment rate. How does that relate to the labor force participation rate? 
then this graph that we're looking at here, Jeff, it looks like, yeah, okay, we're kind of almost back to where we were when the pandemic started and the government shutdown started. But what about that nonlinear dynamic about job growth that should have happened? And of course, the third thing I've already forgotten what it was. I'll, I'll remember when you finish. <laughs> we'll come back yes. to it, right? The first thing you mentioned, the unemployment rate, yes, that's the measure of the official labor force. And we've, we've talked about the, you know, not just we, but economists and, and financial people and observers of the economy have talked about the participation problem ever since 2008, because it has been a legitimate problem. The unemployment rate has been, as Donald Trump ran successfully to the White House on, faulty. The unemployment rate does not take into account the participation problem, which in March of 2020 got increased and ampli amplified even more. So we have an even bigger participation problem, which by pat recent past experience shows the unemployment rate being faulty. Maybe that's not something we should rely, rely upon going forward. As to trying to measure what uh, labor market slack could be, uh, not using the unemployment rate, the charts that you showed that you just showed, Emil where the private levels of private employment haven't even recovered their February 2020 peak already. I mean, we're almost two years later and we still don't have as many jobs as we started with, let alone the four or five million jobs that didn't get created over that two year stretch. We're actually somewhere around the neighborhood of seven, maybe eight million jobs short of where we need to be to be anywhere considered, you know, healthy recovery. You know, economic growth, forget boom, just anything close to just to back to where we were in February 2020. We really need another, we're you know, seven, eight million jobs short. That's an enormous amount of slack that the Federal Reserve is saying, eh, it doesn't matter. And again, it's the same mistake they made before. And they're about to make it again. That's the third point I wanted you to talk about. But before I do that, before I ask you to do that, I just wanted to point out to the audience that extrapolation that you're doing in this chart you're using the growth rate of the recent past, not some incredible yeah. booming 1990s economy or even the debt-fueled early 2000 boom. Well, that one was a little bit, we were missing some employment there, weren't we? But the point is you're yeah. using very recent experience, globally synchronized growth, which was a kind of, a, it was a reflation. It was a it weak, was black loss. weak. It was yeah, it was unimpressive. It was every, yeah, exactly. It was not a boom. It was not the best. It wasn't even the best jobs market in decades of 2014. In, inside so economists, jokes, you know, Jeff. That's, that's where we've gotten <laughs> to. All right, go on. Hey, we, we think it's funny, right? So we're, no, I mean, yeah, the last couple of years, if we should be, you know, at least 4 million jobs, if not 5 million, if not really 6 million jobs more than in February of 2020, yet we're 3 million, 4 million behind February 2020. So the gap is really enormous because even though population expansion has slowed down, it hasn't stopped. We still have people coming into the, well, they would be coming into the labor force if there were jobs. And the unemployment rate simply says, we're going to ignore this 10 million gap or this 8 million gap, whatever the size of it, it's some, some huge gap. We're just going to ignore it because, well, it's the unemployment rate and we think it could be inflationary. The big takeaway of this article is going to be consumer inflation expectations. I should have teased that at the beginning of the show. If I was a good host, that's what I would have done. But now I'm teasing it like 10 minutes in. Jeff, we're going to get to that right after the fact. Very quickly, we're going to discuss that this isn't new. We've done this already, Federal Reserve. We were just here where the labor market headline numbers looked great but we learned it wasn't great. We're doing it again, Jeff. And it wasn't like it was 10 years ago, although it was 10 years ago it was, yes. too. It was just a couple of years ago. I mean, 2018, 2019, we just did this. Remember the 50-year the low in the unemployment rate didn't lead to inflation, nor did it lead to anything good in the economy because 2019 was a globally synchronized downturn, which absolutely captured the United States part of the economy with it. That's why the Fed cut rates in 2019 rather than continue to raise them. As the Eurodollar futures curve had predicted the year before, the Fed was wrong about why it was raising rates. It was wrong to rely on the unemployment rate. It was wrong to think that the unemployment rate said there was no slack. Well, that's what the rate said, but there was slack. There was all that hidden slack in the participation rate 
which was extremely low. So we did this just a couple years ago. The only thing that has changed between now and then is that CPIs have gone much, much higher than they were a couple of years ago. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's inflation. As we talked about before, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. And if it's not money, it's not inflation. Therefore, it's a transitory supply shock, which, by the way, the Federal Reserve actually still agrees with us on that point. Last year, Jay Powell said it was transitory inflation. And this year, he agrees that what caused the CPIs to accelerate in the first place last year, that's going to be transitory. The reason the Fed is hiking rates this year is because of some new developments where they think these new developments will add to those transitory pressures and make inflation or risk inflation becoming actual inflation, which is completely wrong. You've got a great quote in here. I'm going to read it out. Since the Federal Reserve is not a central bank because it doesn't study, monitor, or even much understand the monetary system, and given how inflation is actually a monetary phenomenon, policymakers have to reverse engineer inflation from another angle. And the other angle that they've come up with is inflation expectations. Jeff, tell me if I have this right. If I believe inflation is going to rise I'm in the future, un, unrestrained increases, then I'm going to act on it now and spend with abandon. And that will create some sort of self-perpetuating, self-reinforcing cycle because I'm an idiot. Because, you know, it, it just <laughs> no, assumes it, there's no secondary effect. It's like, I'm going to do this. Right. Oh, you know, meanwhile, my employment situation, you know, I'm... We're in a depression. We just exit. The world is insane. It's crazy. All these things are happening. So, but I'm going to spend with abandon. I got angry, Jeff. Forgive me. Go on. Tell us what inflation expectations are. No, you're are. right. That's the thing. You know, the funny thing is, and, and, and the way they incorporate these into econometric models is they call this rational actors, right? <laughs> they think you're acting rationally. If you start to believe the Federal Reserve is printing money and creating inflation or the Federal Government, whatever. If you start to believe that consumer inflation is going to be permanent, you'll act today as if that's true. Because if you believe inflation is going to be, prices are going to be much higher in the future, you better start buying stuff today before the prices go up. And guess what that does? The more people buy stuff today in anticipation of prices going up, that causes prices to go up. So you're right. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. In it's theory, a this is the model, theory that you right? Get right. And here. so... The idea is if consumers become acclimated to high rates of inflation expectations, that will actually lead to inflation, not just expectations for it, but actual consumer price inflation, as if that's how it works, as if it's not always a monetary phenomenon. And, and really, as you just said, this is just economists trying to reverse engineer their way into an inflation model because they have no idea how to do it using monetary variables. And it's just as we talked about before, remember Jeremy Rudd's paper? Please tell us. There's no evidence for this expectation stuff whatsoever. It's just that they have nothing else to go on. They can't go on money. So what else do you go? Listen, I mean, it sounds kind yeah. of plausible, yeah. doesn't it? If you think inflation is going to be, you don't think it's plausible no, I, it's, at all. it's plausible in a one variable world, I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I, no, and I agree. I think, you know, it sounds plausible until you think, you know, even a second or two more on it, then you're like, this, this is just crazy. Because if you don't have the wherewithal to spend a lot today anticipating prices to rise, what point is it if, if you have higher inflation expectations in the future? But that's what the Fed and the FOMC is raising rates on, is the idea that, okay, we said inflation was transitory in 2021. Now we're into 2022, and the CPI is still going higher. So in this expectations model of inflation, the Fed said, yeah, the stuff that caused the inflation last year, or that caused consumer prices to go up last year, that's transitory. But inflation rates or consumer price increases are still accelerating. We're now more concerned that consumers are going to become normalized to these high rates of expectation or the high rates of consumer price increases. Therefore, inflation expectations are going to unanchor from the low state that they've been in since, oh, I don't know, 2008. Now they're going to anchor it someplace higher, which is going to make that inflation more likely in this orthodox econometric view of how things are supposed to work. That reference you made earlier to Jeremy Rudd, he works for the Federal Reserve, and I believe it was at the end of December or October, 
he wrote a paper uh, researching this issue, and it was remarkable, as I often say, how unvarnished and his opinion it was no holds barred. It really took to task this entire idea of about uh, economists continuing to rely on, well, that's the way we've always done it, thinking, as opposed to actual data and some sort of correlations or causations. Okay, let us assume, nevertheless, that there is such a thing as inflation expectations being a self-reinforcing tornado that will lead to an inflationary inferno. Is there anywhere we can turn to, Jeff? Is there an organization that asks consumers what their inflation expectations are for a year ahead or three years ahead or five years ahead? And what might we learn from the results? As sheer luck would have it, just random coincidence, there is this institution in New York City that surveys, a very extensive survey of consumers and asks them, what do you think about inflation? What do you think consumer prices are going to be one year from now? What do you think consumer prices are going to be three years from now? And that institution in New York City just happens to be the Federal Reserve's New York branch. Very good, very good. And so now we have a chart up in front of us of the one year ahead. And we could see that definitely for one year ahead, inflation expectations have been rising. Recently, they've kind of plateaued. I'm not going to say they've downturned. I guess technically they've downturned, but I would say- Hey, not in your yeah. world, right? Anything, anything that's not still going up is a chain. More data needed, right? To see if this inflection <laughs> is going to hold. The next chart, the three years ahead, I think that that's what I'm looking for in the one year ahead survey in the future. The three year ahead, the latest reading, Jeff, is it fair for me to say that this is the lowest expectations reading since Uncle Sam released the helicopters? This is it. Yeah, and it's, it seems counterintuitive, at least at first glance, right? Because during it peaked back in the three year year ahead as well as the one year ahead metric they both peaked they both changed there was an inflection smaller in the one year but more more pronounced in the three year in october coincidence remember november december january consumer prices at least in terms of the cpi accelerated so these inflation expectations as measured by the federal reserve bank of new york have moved in the different direction from the actual cpis which sort of that's all right, what's going on here that, that leads to a number of questions and going back to the way you framed it at the beginning here let's assume let's assume the fed has a valid reason for thinking expectations play a role in inflation and therefore they are justified in hiking rates because they got to make sure expectations don't unanchor but yet here we see from the federal reserve's own data that expectations are falling despite Expectations for future inflation, especially at the three-year mark, are falling despite current levels of consumer prices accelerating even higher. So even if we take the Fed's theory at face value, there's already sort of evidence in their own data that suggests there's no danger of inflation unanchoring. In fact, there's something else going on here. What's fascinating is that inflection, that peak, and then the round off happened in October, November. And Jeff, did anything happen in deep, liquid, international markets, uh, money markets that corroborated this seemingly you know, silly survey of consumers who don't know anything as sophisticated as this international money? Did anything else happen in October, November? As sheer luck would have it, Emil, it's funny. Everything happened in October, November. We look around the world and we see the same thing happen. But Specifically, deep in liquid market, we can look at tips, inflation, market-based inflation expectations in the form of tips break-even. Those peaked around October and middle November, hmm. too. They've been slightly lower ever since. The long run, five-year, five-year forward inflation rate, which is a measure of where inflation, the market believes inflation expectations have been specifically anchored. Those have been, they never really increased much last year to begin with, still lower than they were in 2014, for example. But ever since last October, October 15th, I believe it was, these long run inflation expectations have been falling again, which is exactly the same thing we see in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York survey of three year forward consumer prices. 
those things correlate very close. I mean, almost exactly. So we have to, what is it that changed in October that's being picked up by both consumers as well as the market for inflation expectation? And by the way, the tips market pays you government protection based on the same CPI. The same CPI that accelerated again in November, December, and January. Why is the tips market of forward-looking inflation expectations down a little bit? Why are consumer surveys from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York down a little bit and down a little bit more in the longer run inflation expectations? These are questions that, that the Fed should be asking as well as people watching our show today should be asking, what is it that changed in October? I want to uh, go back to the consumer survey that because we have a, I guess I've lost my train of thought because was that a rhetorical question you had at the end there, Jeff? What changed in October? Do you want me to ask you what changed in October or no? That's uh, a... Yeah, I, I see. That's the problem. I screw you up all the time, Emil. You have this nice story laid out and I keep going. Ahead. No, I think we were exactly, I think we should go where exactly okay. where you want to go here, which is what is it, you know, what is it we're seeing on uh, not just in terms of the, these, these averages or the medians in terms of inflation expectations, yes. but a little more of the detail. The data that's provided by the New York Fed breaks down the detail, the median, as well as the 75th and the 25th percentiles. And the, we can see a sharp decrease in both the 75th and the median and the 25th percentile results of consumer inflation expectations for three years ahead. But Jeff, I didn't know this until you, you told us the 25th percentile. Holy cow. Wow. I would not have bet this. I would not have expected this. Tell us what happened. It dropped almost to zero. It's extremely low. It's the lowest in the series. And the series only goes back to June of 2013. But still, that's almost a decade there. That's, that's, that's almost eight years of data, or, or that's more than eight years of data. So that's a pretty substantial series. And here we are in the midst of the highest CPIs by far. In that entire span, that entire eight and a half year period, and yet the bottom part of the concert of the surveyed range in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's data, the 25th percentile has never been lower. It was it wasn't even lower during the the March 2020 crisis and the COVID uh, shutdowns and all that stuff. It's never been lower. So as you said, there was a drop in the upper range. The 75th percentile dropped considerably. But I think more importantly, the bottom end of the range, which I believe is more grounded in reality, for reasons that we will go over in a second here, the bottom end of the range is the lowest on record, which suggests we should be asking ourselves, what are they seeing three years from now where they think inflation is going to be the lowest it might have been over the last eight and a half years, or at least that's what they're thinking. What, are, what is really going on? And then you put that together with what we just said in tips markets as well as euro dollar futures and the yield curve and all of these market-based signals. And then you can look at inflation conditions all around the rest of the world. And it's really not that big of a mystery unless you're laser focused in on Jay Powell and the FOMC and the unemployment rate and this inf inflation expectations nonsense. Tell us why you wanted to tell us about the, the bottom 25th percentile while that's more relevant. And then just go ahead and tell us, Jeff, it's a mystery to me. I'm guessing it's because the economy's not in very good shape and the supply-demand imbalances yeah, will go. likely resolve themselves. And if they don't resolve themselves, that's going to be a drag on economic activity. So the resolution would decrease consumer price increases. The not resolution would send us towards something like an economic uh, stagnation or worse. That's my going thesis. You tell me. Yeah, that's the broad strokes, right? I mean, the... the uh... The idea is that number one, the economy is not nearly as, as robust as it seems. Part of that's the money illusion, the fact that consumer prices have been squeezed so much higher based on the supply shock. And then the supply shock itself and the impact on prices is another negative factor that adds to economic weakness because we're all paying a lot more at the gasoline pump just to, or paying more at the grocery store for reasons that have nothing to do with money printing. That just adds to the weight against the economy growing moving forward because we can't afford to absorb those costs and non-discretionary items, which means we'll have to cut back on discretionary spending because as we know, in the aggregate, the labor market is nowhere near recovered. And so that hits the bottom end of the economy extremely hard, which produces even more of these positive feedback loops of negative factor. What I wanted to point out specifically with these surveys, go back to March and April of 2020, what you see in the ranges is, the upper side, the upside, the 75th percentile of the consumer price range exploded in March and April of 2020, even as prices were falling, outright deflation. 
And the reason was because there's a huge chunk of the population out there, huge chunk of, of consumers who believe that QE is money printing. So the upper end of the, the inflation range that the FRB and Y is surveying, those consumers are under the mistaken belief that inflation is the Fed. So that's why I don't put a whole lot of stock into that part of the uh, distribution. If you look at the same time on the lower end, they correctly anticipated what consumer prices had done at that time, which was decline. So the upper end of the consumer survey range, they thought inflation was going to skyrocket immediately in March and April of 2020 because of QE equals money printing and all that stuff, where the bottom end of the range correctly surmised that we were in a real economic trouble that was going to lead to outright deflation regardless of what the Fed or the federal government did about it. And so, again, I put more stock in the bottom end of that range because it more closely matches reality as well as grounded perceptions of what's actually taking place in the real economy. So if we see the bottom end of this range as we have, as we do in the FRB and Y's three-year forward survey, hitting almost zero at record lows. It really, it's something that, that, that stands out, especially, I mean, it would stand out even if it was, if this was the only thing happening but it stands out given all the other things that we just talked about happening as well. If you want to learn more about Jeff's work, go to the Alhambra Investments website. If you, or you can go to Twitter at Jeff Snyder underscore AIP.